All right, so beyond being a shameless self-promotional slide telling you about a book I recently wrote uh, upon which most of these ideas are based, I also would like to acknowledge uh, these students and postdocs that have been working me, with me for quite a while now uh, at this uh, thing or for this thing called the Foley Center for the Study of Lives at Northwestern University. And this is an interdisciplinary research group and program funded by the Foley Family Foundation of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And the mission of the center is to focus research on personality and social uh, development in the adult years, and especially midlife adulthood, and focusing on those positive things that happen in adulthood. There are some. We're not talking cognitive decline here and all those kinds of bad things, but really positive kinds of features of adult psychological development, including, in particular, this idea that some of you uh, are probably familiar with and some not. This idea of generativity, which is not exactly love, although it may have some connections to it. I know love is a main theme for this conference, but it sort of relates to it, and it's more connected really to the idea of care. Uh, the man and here, Eric Erickson, his, his name, or he is associated with this idea of generativity, but that's why that's his wife right there, standing next to him, Joan Erickson. And the reason I include her here as well is that recent biography, biographical studies of the Ericsons suggest that Joan actually was quite res uh, uh, responsible for or instrumental in helping uh, or working with Eric Erickson to develop what became a famous theory of psychological development, the uh, eight stages of development, some of you are aware of it. But in particular, this idea of generativity was probably hers. And it, and it refers to an adult's commitment to caring for and assuring the well-being of future generations as evidenced in parenting, teaching, mentoring, uh, leadership activities, and engaging in a wide range of behaviors that in one way or another are aimed at leaving a positive legacy or a positive effect on the next generation. And although the word is not familiar to everybody, folks know what generativity is about, okay? It's, it's about raising kids. It's about trying to make a positive difference in your community. It's about engaging in institutions that you believe are valuable in your community or more generally uh, as a way of trying to uh, assure or uh, hold on to or make better the world for future generations. It's something I think that spans classes and, and cultures, okay? I mean, where would you be if you didn't have adults in every culture who feel it to be sort of their job, if you will, to try to make a positive difference for the next generation. So we depend on generativity in that way. Now, I'm a personality psychologist, mainly, and I study individual differences in things like generativity and other psychological constructs. And the way we often do that in personality psychology is design these little self-report questionnaires. They are often ridiculed. They are often questioned. It turns out, though, that they often show a fair amount of validity. So here are some items from a questionnaire called the Loyola Generativity Scale. And you've taken scales like this where you rate yourself on items such as, I try to pass along knowledge I have gained through my experiences. Okay, now everybody does that to a certain extent, but you're gonna rate yourself on a one to four scale on that item with one being, yeah, I don't do that very much, let's be clear here. And four, oh man, that's me, I do that a lot. I'm always passing along knowledge to the next generation. I think I would like the work of a teacher. If I were unable to have children of my own, I would like to adopt children. There are a whole set, there's a whole set of items that make up this scale. And in different ways, you can quibble with each item, but in different ways they converge on this idea of being concerned for and committed to making a positive difference for the next generation. Uh, and of course, everybody lies on these scales. I mean, they make themselves sound better than they are perhaps in reality, but we kind of assume that everybody lies about the same amount. And so it turns out that the variation on the scores for this scale uh, and others like it are highly predictive uh, of a lot of important psychological outcomes and social outcomes. So just a few of them uh, on the screen here, and I, I won't belabor these, but there's research showing, for example, that among parents of school children, those who sc score high on measures of generativity are more involved in their kids' schoolwork. Okay, this is a study done years ago in the Chicago Public Schools. 
uh, some colleagues of mine. They gave a whole slew of measures. They controlled for various demographic issues, class, gender, all these kinds of things. And they found that, uh, holding all those things constant, that scoring high on generativity, parents who did that, they were more likely to um, set time aside for their children's homework. They were more likely to attend PTA meetings. They were more likely to know the names of their kids' teachers, stuff like that. They had a whole set of those kinds of things. Well, that's just one set of findings. There's a bunch of things having to do with parenting here. Uh, parents who score high on measures of generativity tend, at least in uh, US society, to show what's called an authoritative parenting style, uh, combining warmth as well as strictness in their parenting. Some research suggests that that kind of parenting style, at least in certain contexts, is associated with better well-being in the kid, moral development in children in the self. Highly generative adults are also sort of doers and joiners, as it turns out. At least in the US, they are more likely to be involved in some sort of a religious tradition. It's not a huge finding, but it shows up consistently. Uh, they're more likely to vote or be involved in the political process. And they may be liberal, they may be conservative, Republican or Democrat. There is no association there with party affiliation or political ideology, but they tend to be involved, okay? And so it's interesting. Highly generative adults who are politically involved are often quite polarized, uh, one left versus right and so forth. The ones who don't care a whole heck of a lot about it Maybe independence, but actually not that. It's pretty much people who are just not involved at all, don't vote, don't care, overwhelmed with other things, tend to score a little bit lower in generativity. More involved in societal institutions, they do more volunteer work, they give money and time to charities, on and on. Uh, so there is a fair amount of research to suggest that although these people are not perfect paragons by any means, highly generative adults nonetheless, that is to say adults who score high, on measures of generativity, compared to their less generative counterparts, really do seem to be involved in the kinds of activities that you would expect they would be involved in if indeed they are more concerned about the well-being of the next generation than the rest of us. Moreover, generativity seems to be good for them as well, or at least correlational studies suggest that it is positively associated with psychological well-being and pro-social personality characteristics. All right, so this little intro here on generativity is something of a warm up. Because what I'm really mainly interested in here is not so much generativity per se, the psychological construct. I'm interested instead in the kind of things that support generativity. And one thing in particular, and it might not be the kind of thing you would expect, would be a support for generativity. And, and that is, I'm interested in the kind of story that a highly generative adult tends to tell about her life or his life as a way, perhaps, of supporting a highly uh, a, a generative approach to life. The focus here, then, for the remainder of the talk will be on how highly generative adults, in American society at least, how they narrate their lives. This is the question. How do these caring adults that research suggests are indeed involved in trying to make a positive difference for the next generation, how do they make sense of who they are? And you could ask, well, like, why do you care about that? All right, oh, I know. You want to know how they got to be generative in the first place. So if by having them tell autobiographical stories about their lives, you can trace developmental factors. Maybe they had a certain kind of experience with their mom. Maybe they went to certain kinds of schools. That's not the answer. That's the wrong answer here. I mean, in personality and developmental psychology, if you actually want to study real development over time, you've got to follow people up over time longitudinally. That's not what we're doing. We see these stories instead not as replays of the past as it was, but as fiction. People are walking around with myths, personal myths. Now, they're not totally made up out of the blue. They're not confabulated. But there are certain mythic features to what psychologists, psychologists today call narrative identity. So narrative identity, you all have a narrative identity, or you're all working on a narrative identity. It is an internalized and evolving story of the self. Now, you probably have a bunch of these. It's not just one great big story. 
But research suggests that by the time people get to be late teenage years, early 20s, and so forth, most people, at least in this society, they're working on something regarding who they are, how they came to be, where their life is going. And that's something, that's something that Erickson called an identity, has narrative features to it. Uh, there are scenes and settings and plots and characters that they you know, that they develop, that they uh, remember from the past and reconstruct. Uh, and so this narrative identity that we're all walking around with and working on, this evolving story, involves in part reconstruing the past, remembering the past in a certain way, and anticipating the future. So it's, again, not objective. It's not your real life history. It is instead your own imaginative rendering of how you came to be the person you are becoming. Highly selective, highly biased, but not totally false. Because most people try to base it on the facts on the ground more or less. They partly do that because they are social animals and if they lie to each other too much, that undermines trust. So when I sit down and talk to people about the stories of their lives, I, I believe that they're giving me a good faith account. Right? Nonetheless, it has certain mythic and fiction, fictional features to it. Uh, narrative identities, among other things, are resources. They're psychological resources. Now, there's all kinds of resources out there. Social support is a resource. Intelligence can be a resource. Economic gain can be a resource. Your story can also be a resource that you call upon at certain times not only to say who you are, but to kind of guide, in a certain extent, where you would like your life to go. I think nar life narratives have some implications for how people do agency, a topic that's come up here a lot. Sometimes the big decisions in our lives are informed somewhat, at least, by the story that we are working on. I collect people's life stories. They sit down in the lab, they listen, they talk for couple hours, usually not to me anymore. I've got research assistants who do this. My students do a lot of this life story interviewing. I do a little bit of it now. Uh, and, but it's a scripted scenario. It goes a couple hours, and this is pretty much the outline of it in bare bones. Okay, So if you're a participant in one of these studies, you come into the lab, you sit down on a comfortable couch, you know why you're there. You're there to tell the story of your life. But we don't just say, OK, go get going on it, what's the story of your life, we kind of ease them into it. So you start out, well, with this. Think about your life as if it were a novel or you know, a book. Now, it's not. Your, your life is not a novel. You know, everybody knows it's not a novel, but you can sort of imagine it that way. In fact, it turns out that people have very little trouble imagining their lives as a story. When I started doing this research 25 years ago or so, I thought this was going to be a problem. Like maybe the narrative or the story metaphor won't work. They'll say, story? What? I don't know what you mean. Like chapters? I don't, I don't get it. Nobody ever says that. We've had one, OK, in 25 years. One person says, I just can't do it. I don't think about my life that way. Interesting. Um, but hardly ever does that kind of thing happen. Uh, it's, it's not just a random metaphor, this idea of your life as a book. It's not like, think about your life as if it were a circus. All right, three rings, you know, like, I guess I could do that. If I, if I had to do that, I could do that. But story, oh yeah, sure, once upon a time. All right. So you start out with these life chapters. Give us an overview of your, uh, like a table of contents of your life chapters. Give each chapter a name or title, quick plot summary. We go 20 minutes on this or, or so forth. It is tape recorded or, uh, yeah, recorded. Uh, and then eventually it's transcribed uh, into a written document. Uh, key scenes, high points, low points. So now you've given us this overview of your life. Let's talk about the greatest moment in your life. And I don't mean like freshman year in college. I mean like maybe the first day of college or some afternoon that you spent with this particular person. It needs to be circumscribed in time and space, an episode that has characters in it, a scene, all right? You remember it vividly. You can recall what you were thinking and feeling. You can say to me now as the narrator, you're being the protagonist in this scene, what, what you think that story, that scene means about who you are and how you came to be. Uh, for midlife adults, which I spend most of our time of, uh, interviewing, birth of a first child is probably the most common 
one that comes up for high point seam, but even that one is only about 15 to 20 percent of the time. There are lots of different high point seams. And then low point, warm them up at the high point, then we hit them with this one, the worst moment in your life. And, you know, it's, people cry oftentimes. I mean, I, probably half the people in our interviews get a little worked up sooner or later in the interview. This might be a point where they will. Um, and again, what happened in the scene? What were you thinking and feeling? A turning point event in your life? There is eight or nine of these key scenes that we ask for. Uh, and then now we're about halfway through or maybe even further in the interview. Uh, important characters in your life. Tell us about some of your heroes and villains. Where is the story going in the future? Okay, so it's not just a reconstruction of the past. It's how, what you imagine the future to be. What's the next chapter going to be about? Where's your life going? Again, midlife adults usually, sometimes younger people, they typically see that they've got a lot of life in front of them. Uh, towards the end of the interview, we talk about personal beliefs and values, especially interested in religious beliefs. Americans, uh, uh, many, not all of course, but many have pretty strong views there. They'll tell you a little bit about it at this point in the interview. And finally, at the end, a life motif or message. Looking back on the story you just told me, what would you say is the theme that runs through your life? So let me give you an example of the kind of data we work with. And let's consider here the life story of a man. We'll call him Jerome Johnson. He's a retired African American, about, I think he's 63 years old when we interviewed him. And uh, at that time, he's spending a lot of time and energy doing volunteer work with children and youth. Uh, now, it turns out Jerome, Jerome Johnson, you know, we typically test people before we interview him. We give them all our a bunch of, bunch of measures. He scored off the map really high on our assessments of generativity, that construct I introduced you to at the beginning. That's why we're interviewing them. Now, we don't interview everybody. We interview people who show a certain kind of psychological profile. So in this particular study, we were inter interviewing highly generative adults, adults who score high on generative measures. And then we were interviewing folks who were matched to them uh, demographically, but who score sort of in the mediocre range on generativity. So here we got a highly generative adult. Of course, the interviewer doesn't know he just knows he's interviewing them. And Jerome Johnson doesn't know why he's being interviewed. He doesn't, he, we don't tell him that you're the most generative guy we've ever met or anything like that. He just, he knows that we want to talk to him about his life story. Uh, okay, and so we get to the point in the interview where he is going to tell you about a turning point scene in his life. And this is how he tells it. He says it was a chance encounter in the late 1960s, probably I would think 67 or 66, a uh, uh, chance encounter with the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. And a year or two before he was assassinated, King came to a small city in the Midwestern part of the US to speak to civic and religious leaders and to rally citizens, black and white, for civil rights. Now, Jerome Johnson was assigned at the time to be one of King's bodyguards. Back then, the local police would provide bodyguard help for visiting dignitaries. And King was always uh, a controversial figure, and there were always threats. And so they had to have strong security in the case of Reverend Martin Luther King. So Johnson was assigned to be one of the bodyguards. And uh, so it, it, Johnson, I'll get the picture of Johnson. He's an African-American policeman, uh, probably around age 30 at this point. Uh, an ambitious man who had been a football star in high school and who completed a tour of duty in the US Air Force. Now Johnson, as he tells it today, now this is age 63, so he's thinking back 33 plus years. Johnson said that at that time he had been uh, dreaming or wanting very much to become police chief. Uh, but he was frustrated. No black man had ever been promoted to sergeant in that city, a city, let alone considered for chief. And Johnson's fellow officers, good friends he had on the force, both black and white, counseled him against taking the promotional exam. They said, come on, you don't have a shot. Uh, you should be happy with what you've got. His friends were saying, you know, you're, you're doing great. What are you all depressed about? Uh, and he said, well, I want to be chief, and uh, I want to take the exam, and I think uh, maybe I'm just going to quit the force because uh, I was thinking, quoting him, I was thinking of leaving the police force because I, I felt it was a hopeless thing that a black could ever be a police chief. Uh, yeah, that's how he described it in the interview. But then my life turned around, he explains. It was at a time I was assigned to be a bodyguard for Dr. Martin Luther King, and he was here, I think, maybe two, three days, and so I spent some time with him. And we started talking, and I told him how frustrated I was about the fact that no black had ever been promoted 
maybe it's time to move on, I told him, because I didn't see that there was much, uh, anything that was going to change at all. And he, King, King just said a couple of things, just very briefly, he said, you know, he said, never give up. And that was basically the end of the conversation. Well, you know, nothing profound there, never give up. I mean, I could have said that, but it wasn't me. It was Martin Luther King saying it, a little bit more gravitas there. Uh, well, King, uh, the, Johnson says, you know, I, I thought about that before, of course, but when he said it to me, and the way he said, keep the faith, you know, and never give up, you know, and never stop dreaming the dream, well, I held on to that, and I went on, and things changed. He turned me around from walking out the door. All right, so we follow up in the interview, and but before we do, just notice the structure of this little scene. Now, I just I treat these scenes as pieces of text. They're just words. They're they're, they're uh, little fictions. Uh, by the way, as you'll see in a moment, we there's some interesting things that happen in this man's life that we actually checked out and they turn out to be correct, but it doesn't matter to me really if this really happened or not. I'm interested in the structure of the scene. So notice the structure, it's pretty straightforward. The episode begins in hopelessness, uh, or at least negativity, but the situation is transformed rather dramatically by a fortuitous meeting. In simple terms, there is a movement in the text from uh, a negative emotional situation to a very positive outcome, what I call a redemption sequence. As we learn in the interview later, according to Johnson, and we did follow this up, it turns out to be true, Johnson did eventually take the exam. And after many years, he did. He became the first black chief on that force. So now he's in retirement as having been the first black chief on that force. And so he's looking back on this event in a very different way than he might have looked back on it had he not been the first black chief on that police force. And he tells a story at this point in his, career, his, his life, age 63, that is filled with redemption sequences. In the worst days of the Great Depression, for example, late 1930s here, he's really young, his, he tells a story where his family uh, is sitting around the Christmas tree at Christmas time, and apparently there's no money or very little. Uh, everybody's kind of depressed. He's probably embellishing it, but I'm kind of getting this sort of like uh, Charles Dickens, uh, you know, the, uh, picture where you know they're, everybody's sitting there really, really kind of depressed. And voila, a neighbor knocks on the door, delivers turkey and presents. Redemption. Or at a high school basketball game. Opposing white players call Jerome a nigger. They yell it out. His mom is sitting in the stands. She runs out of the gym screaming. Okay? Now, redemption might have been Jerome sinking the winning basket. Or the white player who made the, who, who made the call tripping and breaking his leg. But no, that's not what happened. I don't, we don't know what ever happened in the game. But what Johnson says, yeah, yeah, it was really bad. That was terrible. But you know, that event, it toughened me up. Okay? After the fact, he gives it a positive interpretation, somewhat positive. Again and again in the story, the protagonist endures suffering in the beginning of the scene, but is somehow rewarded in the end. Now, I don't want to give you the idea that Jerome Johnson's life story is all about this. But he has a lot of little stories like these I have described. And we call them redemption sequences, where a bad or emotionally negative, that is sad, frightening, humiliating scene turns good or emotionally positive, happy, rewarding. The bad is salvaged, saved, redeemed by a positive outcome or turn of events. Now, it's all fiction. It's all narrative here. Uh, these stories come in two forms, these little scenes. Uh, and I've given you illustrations of both. The first form is a lot like the Christmas Day story where things are really, really bad, and then in real time, something happens that makes them good, at least as the narrator remembers it. The other kind, and the other kind I think is actually slightly more common, the second kind, is like the story of the racial expletive during the basketball game, where there is a really bad event that occurs, and there's nothing that redeems it in the moment. But years later, you look back as a narrator and you say, yeah, yeah, that was terrible, but you know, you see some positive gain. You see some attribute. You see some characteristic. You see some value that came along as a result of that event. Not that you would want that event to have occurred, all right? 
is sometimes people will give you redemptive sto stories about really horrible things that you know they would never want to have happened in the first place, but it did, okay? It did happen. And so what kind of positive meaning, or do you take a positive meaning from the event? Now, I'm no, the type on this is a little hard to see, but this is simple data from a study many years ago. Actually, it's the one Jerome Johnson was in. And what we're doing, I do a lot of this kind of thing. It's fairly straightforward is we code life story interviews for essentially the density or the amount of redemption imagery in the story. And we control for story length and all that kind of thing. We've got various little metrics for this. And in this particular study, we've got two groups of participants. It really doesn't get simpler than this. We got a sample of about 40 highly generative adults. That is, they're chosen for interviews because they score high on self-report measures of generativity. And we got a matching sample, I think in this study it might have been 30, I'm not sure, small study, of matched but not so generative adults. Okay, they score low on measures of self-report generativity. And this, the height of the bars is simply a reflective of how strong the redemption theme is in the life narrative interviews. And you can see here that redemption is much higher, uh, statistically significantly, in the highly generative adults than it is in the less generative adults. Uh, number of studies doing this kind of thing. Uh, here's some more simple data from a different study, and this is just looking at, you know, well, if, how, to what extent does redemption imagery in your life narrative, is that associated with psychological well-being? Life satisfaction, self-esteem, life coherence, depression. In this particular assessment, we see simple correlations. There are more elaborate studies that control things and so forth. The basic take home from our lab and a number of other studies that have looked at this is that when people have a lot of redemption imagery in their life narrative accounts, they tend to report somewhat higher levels of psychological well-being, self-reported. It's not surprising, I guess, uh, but nice to see nonetheless. They also score lower on measures of depression. Now, it turns out that this theme of redemption in our research is, is part of a suite of five themes that together comprise a certain kind of script, a, a story that is it's idealized here. This is like an idealized form. And nobody's life story is exactly like this. But highly generative adults in our research tend to tell life narratives that get a little closer to this model, if you will, with respect to all five themes, compared to their less generative counterparts. We've shown this again a number of times. And so let me give you a sense very quickly of what this kind of story is. But you need to remember that you know, nobody's story fits this exactly, and every story is unique. All right, But you can still code them for various sorts of stuff. So oftentimes, highly generative adults will begin their story. That is to say, when they're talking about childhood, they will point to some early advantage, the upper left-hand bubble on the screen here, that they remember enjoying. And I suspect everybody in the room here could come up with something. Mom liked me the best, right? Or I had this fabulous first grade teacher who saw something in me. Or I was skilled in violin for some reason at age seven, and that was my advantage. Or our family was the only one on the block whose parents weren't divorced. Or the only one that were divorced. But you know, that was really good because I grew up fast that way. I mean, it's all in the interpretation. So by about a three to one margin, highly generative adults versus less generative adults are more likely to like indicators or you know, like tell you about an early advantage episode, an early blessing that they seem to enjoy. By about a four to one margin, they are more likely than less generative adults to bring into their story almost like gratuitously, almost out of the blue, memories in which bad things happen to other people, suffering of others. Okay, or memories that suggest more generally things like societal oppression, unfairness. Uh, so they might remember and make a big deal out of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Right? I mean, everybody in my generation remembers where they were. I'm old. I'm 60. In when John F. Kennedy was killed. Uh, but would I put that in my life story? You know, if somebody was asking me about my childhood, would I signal that? I don't know if I would. I, I don't think I probably would not. Uh, and that's a dramatic one. It might be something else like, uh, well, I lived on this little street in Akron, Ohio, and there was this little retarded boy. 
at the end of the block. And yeah, the kids used to beat him up. All right, I used to beat him up too. And then somebody says that. Like, well, why did you tell me that? I didn't ask you. I didn't ask you for an early memory about witnessing the suffering of others. I might have asked you for a negative early memory. I might have asked you for the worst moment in your life. You might have said this during the chapters section of the interview, but I never prompted you. This is all kind of just sort of comes out. So it's as if the highly generative adults in general, they kind of want to get across a point early on, although it's all implicit. And the point goes something like this. You got to know this about me. I'm blessed, but others, they're not. Others suffer. Or I am the gifted protagonist who journeys forth into a dangerous world. They love stories like that. Okay, it sets them up to be a kind of hero here. These are not modest people, by the way, highly generative adults. You will find some features of this narrative, perhaps, that you don't like. Uh, maybe you already have. All right, moral depth and steadfastness. Highly generative adults will often say something like this about their lives. Um, yeah, you know, I struggled a little bit early on with religion, politics, all that stuff. Uh, but I got it worked out. And I know what I believe, damn it. And I'm strongly adhering to it. And you can believe what you believe, that's fine. But I've got my ideology, and I'm not staying up at night wringing my hands wondering about the meaning of life, or what's right, and what's wrong, or even the questions that we've been debating here in this particular uh, symposium, moral questions, philosophical questions. I'm too busy for that crap, all right? I know what I believe. It guides me, uh, and I'm sort of almost a true believer. Moral depth and steadfastness, we call, call, call it. I don't really like this theme very much as an academic trained to question things and so forth. And it's not like all the highly generative adults do this kind of thing. But you get more of this clarity and strength of their moral beliefs, at least as they tell it, in the life stories of highly generative adults compared to their less generative counterparts. Redemption I've talked about. So you move ahead in life. Bad things happen. I study midlife adults. Bad stuff has happened by then losses, divorce, you name it, a lot of bad things have happened, setbacks in jobs, unemployment. Uh, but more often than not, or more often than occurs with less generative adults, they find positive meanings in negative events. And then as they look to the future, they see more um, growth in psychosocial uh, engagement. So it might be the case that the world is going to hell in a handbasket. A highly generative adult might tell you that. After all, there's global warming. There's the problems in Syria. God knows what's going to happen next. But in my little neck of the woods, in my business, with my students, in my family, wherever it is, things are getting better. I'm making it so that things get better, or at least I think they will down the road. This kind of keep hope alive notion runs through these stories. Right? Now, I think you can see why if you had a story like this, it might help you when you woke up in the morning get out there and do generative stuff. Generativity is not for the weak of heart or the faint of heart or the weak spirited. I mean, think about what's involved in generativity. Okay, raising kids. I, you know, some of you have, some of you haven't. Um, there's a famous line in King Lear where he says, uh, sharper than a serpent's tooth is the ingratitude of a child. Okay, well, problems in generativity drove Lear to madness. They don't do that for most people. But this idea that my kids don't appreciate me, they're not doing what I want them to do, I mean, this is a common refrain among parents that I know, at least. And put parenthood aside and talk about all these other ways in which highly generative adults put themselves out there, like agitating for political change, maybe, or working for their candidate, whether it be a conservative or a liberal, or getting engaged in the church or the synagogue and trying to make a difference there, and the enrollments are declining. And there's a lot of stuff that goes wrong. But if you have a story that says, yeah, bad stuff happens. Remember that thing with the basketball game? You know, My mom, she ran screaming out of there. Remember Christmas morning? But if you've got a story that says, you know, usually those bad events lead to positive outcomes, that kind of resiliency that that suggests in a redemptive story, I think it might provide the kind of support that you would need to carry on as a generative adult and put yourself out there. You don't have to be generative. I mean, you could stay home. You could watch soap operas, you could go to the mall, but no, you've decided instead to like do this stuff that is involved in making a positive difference for the next generation, so I think you need a good story to set it up. Moreover, if you really do believe that mom liked you the best, or that you had this early blessing, and that 
others didn't, and that the world is a dangerous place because bad things happen to presidents and retarded kids and everybody else I knew. A lot of bad stuff happened, but I was lucky. Okay, I was lucky. It kind of sets you up. Like you know, I well, I guess I've got to, I got to give back. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm one of the blessed. I've, I'm called, if you will. Uh, to go forward, and this kind of religious language does come up in some of these life stories of highly generative adults, but you know, the, sometimes it's not framed in a religious way at all. Often, usually, it's not. In fact, uh, but this says this sense of a kind of almost manifest destiny, like you know, I've been chosen maybe by luck, by genes, by the fact that that second grade teacher liked me. Who knows what it was? Hard work. Sometimes they'll take credit. Um, I've been chosen. And so if you believe you're chosen, you believe the world needs you, things are messed up out there, but you've been blessed, if that's the story you're walking around with, then I think, yeah, it's, it, it helps to support, probably supports lots of things. But in particular, I think it provides a reasonable so support for generativity. Now, I'm especially interested in how culture shapes, and this is just to anticipate questions here uh, from uh, from folks who are, uh, Alan Fisk and others, who are, are going to ask me the culture question because it's the obvious question, it should be. Um, like, I'm very interested in how cultures shape the stories that people tell. And I, I don't want to say that, you know, American society has cornered the market by any means on this idea of redemption. I, I don't believe that. I think, you know, you can find ideas like that in many different societies. But there are certain favorite variations on the theme that enjoy a certain kind of cachet in American society as uh, projected in, through history and heritage, movies and so forth. I mean, I've, in my book, The Redemptive Self, I do a lot of cultural analysis uh, looking at various kinds of iconic texts and expressions in American culture, looking for this theme of redemption. Well, here's one form of it. Redemption as atonement, highly religious sort of notion. The move here from negative to positive is from sin to salvation. There are millions of American adults walking around now with stories that are about redemption as atonement. George W. Bush, by the way, is one of them. I mentioned him yesterday. A uh, very strong narrative about finding Jesus in his late 30s uh, uh, at a, uh, by the way, at a Holiday Inn coffee shop in, um, in Texas where he met with a, uh, a revivalist, uh, a, um, a, a minister. Uh, and uh, accepted Jesus into his heart, and he sees that as uh, arguably the biggest turning point in his life, uh, that, and there's a few other things too. But I mean, there's a lot of folks walking around with those kinds of stories. They go back, I mean, they go way back, and uh, this isn't exactly it here, but this Christian sort of uh, sense, and there are stories like this in other religious traditions, but it, it's very much like well-known in American society, even if you're not of this persuasion, you know about this. Picture John Winthrop here in the Puritans, uh, of the Puritans, and, and a quote that I love from him that gets across generativity, for one thing, but also uh, redemption uh, through a religious vocation and this sense that I've been chosen to do this kind of thing. It's a very kind of Protestant uh, sort of notion. Uh, the end uh, of our work here in the world is to improve our lives, to do more service to the Lord, the comfort and increase of the body of Christ, whereof we are members that ourselves and our posterity may be better preserved from the common corruptions of this evil world to serve the Lord and work out our salvation under the power and purity of his holy ordinances. From a sermon in 1630, it's the same one, I believe, where he uses the expression city on a hill that's much used by politicians. Well, some people like stories like this. You know, they find them moving, to go back to a theme earlier for today. Other people cringe. They hate this stuff. It's like fingernails on a blackboard. All right, uh, so maybe you like this one better. Right? I do. Redemption as liberation. Now, I have never interviewed anybody in our so in our studies who uh, was literally enslaved or said that you know they were they experienced anything as horrible as African American slaves in the United States experienced in the 17th and 18th century and 19th century. But um, people use metaphors like that when they talk about the past. They'll say, you know, I felt I felt oppressed. My parents wouldn't let me out of the house very much. That first marriage, I, I couldn't make a move without him you know, criticizing me. And then I got out of it. I escaped. I was emancipated. I was liberated. Right. This, this is a very powerful discourse in American society today, and most recently and strongly used, I think, in the movement towards legalization of same, and recognition of same-sex marriage. 
a, a discourse of social liberation. Uh, but it has its most powerful, I think, examples in, in the 19th century letters with uh, the slave narratives uh, written by escaped uh, African-American slaves. They escaped from the South to the North. Uh, many of these slaves, they've been studied intensively. Henry Louis Gates and others have looked at them. Here's uh, arguably the most famous one or the frontispiece piece from it from Frederick Douglass and one of my favorite quotes that comes from this particular text. Um, from my earliest recollections, I date the entertainment of a deep conviction that slavery would not always be able to hold me within its foul embrace. And in the darkest hours of my career in slavery, this living word of faith and spirit of hope departed not from me, but remained like ministering angels to cheer me through the gloom. Now, what I love about this passage, okay, is that it's just totally a lie. You think about it. He never doubted, he said. What about September 10th, Saturday afternoon, 1837? For a moment there at 4.15, did you doubt that you might not make it out of slavery's foul embrace? Well, of course. We cut the author all kinds of slack here, as we do in everyday life storytelling. We don't expect people's stories to like be true to the letter exactly. The way in which he pro portrays this moral steadfastness, one of those five themes, although much more dramatic here than you ever get in any of the life story interviews I do, but the way he presents it is one of strength and power. And you admire this, or many people do, admire the kind of fortitude here, even if, if you think about it for a moment, you say, well, it's probably not exactly true, right? But it's powerful. And this kind of moral steadfastness theme, I mean, you know, this, this is a wonderful example of it that inspires but you know, not all examples of moral steadfastness do inspire, but this is, this is a good one that way. So some people like this kind of story. It enjoys tremendous cachet in uh, American culture, but uh, uh, there are others. Oh, I should point out uh, President Obama's, uh, boy, talk about a, a text on narrative identity. This was written when Ob uh, President Obama, long before anybody knew who he was, except his wife, I think, uh, Barry, Barry Obama, well, he was, he was Barack at that point. Uh, age 31, around there in his early 30s, he puts together this life story, and it's essentially his narrative identity at that point in life, age 30. He talks about how he came to be the person he is becoming. He describes it, uh, uh, or it has been described by critics as a redemptive narrative of ascent, uh, emphasizes this idea of liberation, although interestingly, it's not his personal liberation. He did, he was, he did not feel that he was strongly discriminated against as a young man. As a, as a young boy. I mean, he had, he had issues with respect to race, but it's more an identification with a long history of movement, going back Martin Luther King Jr. and before, being seeing himself as part of this historical movement that is moving towards um, emancipation, uh, expressed in King's famous uh, note that the, what, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Well, this, was, this is like a motto for Barack in this particular book. People have criticized the book. They said he made stuff up a little bit. He confessed, he kind of like made smooth things out, gave it more drama than it really was. Classic narrative identity business. We do this when we try to make sense of the kind of person we are becoming. Redemption is upward social mobility, sometimes called the American dream. Uh, talk about a myth. I mean, upward mobility in the United States is harder, uh, has been for 30 or 40 years than it is in Europe. Studies show this definitively. But we still seem to think, or still seem to love stories about upward mobility. It goes back at least to Benjamin Franklin, his autobiography published in 1771, in which he writes, from the poverty and obscurity in which I was born and in which I passed my earliest years, I have raised myself to a state of affluence and some degree of celebrity in the world. It occurs to me that we are at Franklin and Marshall College right now. Uh, I assume that's Benjamin Franklin we're talking about here. So uh, somebody familiar, not obviously just on the FNM campus, uh, but uh, talk about an understatement. I mean, you know, he, the autobiography does talk a lot early on about, you know, he comes down to Philadelphia, age 18, 19, he's got like five cents in his pocket, he buys a couple of rolls, he's walking down the street holding the rolls, he's got nothing. By the end of the story, he is a world famous statesman, a signer of the Declaration, founder of the University of Pennsylvania, an inventor, uh, one of the most famous people in the world. Not a perfect man by any means, a lot of glitches in his life story, uh, but certainly a redemptive one that, that has inspired many people and, and, and provides a form that is sometimes used uh, in stories, uh, uh, immigrant stories, uh, of success stories, and so forth. 
Last but not least uh, in my pantheon of great redemptive narratives in American culture, these, these being stories that are sometimes drawn upon implicitly by many of us, including highly generative adults, is redemption as recovery. And this one is a little different than the other three in that it does not look forward as much. It's not like riches are out there and I'm in rags. It's not about salvation that follows sin. It's not about the liberation that is to come. It's about something I lost, okay? Initially a medical idea. I was, I got, I was healthy once, I got sick, I need to recover. But this general idea of recovering something that you've lost, it's very powerful. Um, a trope in American uh, society, many, many others too. And arguably the most uh, influential spokesperson for this story is this little girl right here. Uh, that's long ago, of course. Who is that? Anybody know? It's totally Oprah. Yeah, that's Oprah when she was three. Here's a more recent photo of her. Uh, okay, and so why do I pick Oprah? Well, partly because she lived a story of recovery. In her case, she talks about recovering her goodness and innocence that she lost as a function of being abused, as a function of being discriminated against, many th bad things that happened to her when she was young. But more importantly, this highly generative American adult, regardless of what you think about her, I happen to admire her, uh, she sells this story more effectively than anybody sold a story like this probably since Ralph Waldo Emerson went around the East and told stories about how you all need to get back in with that good inner self that you lost long ago because you started conforming to society. Oprah actually carries little aphorisms from Emerson in her purse, at least according to a Newsweek article I read a while back. Uh, and she sells this story. She encourages people to think about their lives this way. You know, um, okay, things went bad for you. You were abused, or maybe it's your fault. You got addicted. You, you lost something, but you can get it back. You need to just, just focus and get, get inside yourself and find what you really want, that deep, authentic you. It's always good. If you go deep enough, there'll be something good there, Oprah believes. This is not about original sin. It's about being really, really good. And you lost it because you were an addict, or you were a criminal, or you were abused, or whatever it is, or you just didn't live up to expectations, or you conformed to society, but you can get it back. You can recover the lost uh, goodness. And so I grew up a little Negro child who felt so unloved and so isolated, and the emotion I felt as a child was loneliness, and now the exact opposite has occurred for me in adulthood. Um, a redemptive sequence there. The general move is from sickness, trauma, and addiction to the full actualization of the good inner self. In closing, I would like to suggest to you uh, two things. First, this is a cool story. It's a powerful story. I believe it's a story, this kind of story, or these kinds of stories, and there's a lot of variations, help to provide support for generative lives. And the kinds I've featured here in the second half seem to be especially designed, if you will, for stories that work in certain segments of American society. So about 85% of me really likes this story, but the other 15% finds it to be problematic, and I suspect this will come up. And we can ask, is this kind of story always a good story to have about your life? Probably not. No story is always good, but it's worth kind of considering here for a moment as I close what some of the issues are in this story that are sort of problematic, or some of the biases or the cultural freight that runs through this story that seem in some ways or another to give it less of the gloss that it maybe it had a few moments ago. All right, so there's a, there's a conflict that runs through these stories oftentimes. Uh, and it, it connects to a theme that we're involved in here at this conference, between personal agency and societal structure. My highly generative adults, they're not very good sociologists when they talk about their lives. You, 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 and I ask them questions about class and social structure, and race comes up occasionally. But a lot of the things that happen that end up to be good and redemptive are because of micro kinds of things in their lives, like things they did or things their friends did and so forth. And it's a lot about agency, going up against societal structure, and not as much acknowledgement as you might want, say, in a story that says, yeah, all right, I, mean, I'm, I'm, I am the hero of this story, but there's a lot of other stuff going on that might uh, be responsible for how it came to be. Related, this notion of uh, I'm blessed, but others suffer. There's a little bit of a kind of exceptionalism that runs through this thing. Okay, I'm the exception to the rule. Now, you've got to remember, these are people like Jerome Johnson, 
He is the exception to the rule. He was the first black police chief on that force. Now, not all of my highly generative adults are that distinguished, but they typically see themselves as movers and shakers in the world, having a positive, making a positive difference. Okay, so there's a sense in which they are kind of exceptional, almost by definition, because they're high on the generativity scale. Uh, but you know, if everybody went around thinking they were exceptional, and you know, I got this great good inner self, I don't know, it bothers me a little bit. Um, oh, it's a weird thing. My slide's never done this. Moral clarity and self-righteousness, again, related. Uh, how is it that these highly generative adults who tell these redemptive stories, what is it about these redemptive stories that the protagonist has to be such a true believer, has to see values as guiding everything he does or she does, is so ideologically certain and like I'm thinking, no, oh, come on, like how about some skepticism here? Don't you worry at night that you're not doing the right thing? Yeah, maybe they would admit it a little bit. Uh, but th th this runs through a fair number of stories, this kind of sense of moral clarity and self-righteousness. And some people can find these kinds of stories downright annoying for that reason. And finally, maybe most importantly, is there a naivete that runs through especially redemptive life stories? And I think there are variations here. For some people there are and some people there aren't. You get a little bit of it in Jerome Johnson, though. I mean, you do get the sense after you listen to his story, you yeah, know, if anybody just kept at it and tried hard enough, yeah, they could be the first black police chief, too. I mean, come on. I mean, there could only be one first black police chief, right? And so, I mean, there is this, you know, sometimes this almost blithe assumption that runs through these stories that, yeah, bad stuff's going to happen, you know? But usually positive things result. Well, we can all think of lots of bad things that have happened, maybe in our own lives or in the world, with some obvious examples in the world. And like, you want to find a redemptive meaning out of that? You want to find some positive meaning out of the Holocaust? I mean, you can do it. You can try. You can make an argument like that. But isn't it sort of an insult to the 5 million people or more who died in the Holocaust? You want to try to make something positive out of 9-11? I mean, there are events in life, personal life and public life, that are so bad that to try to salvage a positive meaning out of them, sometimes you wonder, am I just defying common sense or insulting the cosmos or doing an injustice to those who have suffered by even trying to do so? I don't really know how to see that, but this is one of the critiques that often gets laid on stories like this. So I want to say here at the end that uh, I, I believe that having a good life story, a powerful life story, uh, one that might look like this, there's other forms of course, can support a caring and productive life. We all need good stories, there are many challenges in life, but then no story you know, has it all, no story is perfect, and we can see here with the, in this highly valued narrative or set of narratives even in our society that there are likely to be some downsides to the, to the rosy picture that seems to come across at first. Thank you. <laughs> Testing, all right. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. It's been a really stimulating couple of days. Um, it's, uh, it actually feels a little bit daunting to me to be the last uh, person scheduled to speak, um, but I know there will be a lot of discussion, so there's very little risk that I'll have the last word, and that's comforting. Um, <laughs> first off, I want to uh, thanks all of, thank all of the conference organizers, Bennett Helm, Agnieszka Jaworska, Jeff Seidman, um, and of course, Nicole Hoover as well, who I know has done a lot of work in putting this together. Um, and uh, many thanks to Dan for this fascinating paper. Um, on a less serious note, I want to thank you in particular for giving me that image of the free ring circus as a way of thinking of my life, because that will be really useful on certain days. <laughs> um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to comment um, on Professor McAdams' work which takes up a number of themes that are of special interest to me and links them together in a fascinating way. These themes include care as a virtue, um, the concept of narrative identity or narrative agency, um, and the question of meaning or meaningfulness in life. I'm going to begin, although I know the focus here has mainly been on narrative, I'm going to begin by talking about care a little bit. 
um, it was refreshing to me to see care take center stage as the key virtue of a major life stage. Um, midlife um, is this long, sort of loosely bounded phase, which I guess I'm now in which I guess I'm now firmly planted. Um, and from that vantage point, I can certainly recognize and identify with the challenge um, that McAdams, following Eric Erickson, and as I just learned today, also Joan Erickson, um, locates in this phase. And that's the challenge of avoiding stagnation um, and achieving generativity. So having consolidated an identity and established long-term intimate bonds in the preceding life stages, the adult human in his or her middle year years begins, if he or she is not to stagnate, to invest energy in preparing for the next generation, um, either directly through caring for children who are the next generation, or indirectly through caring about or for things that have transgenerational importance. Why this concern for future generations should, should so characteristically be what saves us from stagnation um, is perhaps all too clearly rooted in the realities of human life. Once we reach a certain point in life, we can no longer avoid facing the fact that we will die, um, and we want to have something to pass on or to do something that will make a difference beyond the narrow confines um, of our own biological life. So caring, not just caring about, but productively caring for the next generation, devoting energy to its needs and welfare and to the communities, institutions, and practices that will sustain it and its projects, is so characteristic of this phase of life, when things go well at least, um, as to seem a marker of full adulthood. But what is care and what is it to care virtuously? Um, drawing on the work of um, our conference organizers, actually Bennett Helm, Agnieszka Jaworska, and Jeff Seidman, um, I regard care as a compound of emotions, desires, and dispositions that together construe their focal object as important. Um, to see something as important is to see it as a source of reasons to act and react in very specific ways. One who cares about an object is emotionally vulnerable to its ups and downs and motivationally susceptible to its needs. In a tradition of thought that has roots in Harry Frankfurt's influential work on freedom of the will, what you care about um, quite literally makes you who you are. Um, in defining your deliberative perspective, care defines the boundaries of the self. As such, care might also be thought to distinguish self-governed from non-self-governed activity. To act autonomously, that is, might be thought to be um, to act in a manner governed by one's self-constituting concerns. So far, this line of thought about care and its relation to the self and human agency says little about care specifically as a virtue or excellence of human agency as opposed to about care as a mental state. Um, in a loosely Aristotelian vein, one might suggest that um, care as a virtue requires caring about the right sorts of things in the right way um, and to the right degree. One who mistakes the trivial for the important or fails to be appropriately attuned to the object of care or reacts all out of proportion with the ups and downs that object experiences, um, certainly does not care well um, and is not likely to make great headway with his or her generative impulses. The difficulty lies, of course, in figuring out what's worth caring for and how to care for it properly. It is perhaps easier to characterize failures than successes in this regard. Um, at midlife, for example, it's unlikely that one will avoid stagnation by obsessing over um, trivial or plainly futile pursuits um, or by investing energy in projects that resonate with no one beyond oneself. Um, and most of us feel, I think, that we can recognize paradigm examples um, of such failures, at least in others, if not always in ourselves. Um, the highly generative adults that McAdams studies avoid triviality, futility, and marginality by coming to care about others um, and about things that matter to others, and in particular about things that will continue to matter to generations beyond their own. But coming to care or continuing to care may be easier said than done. We will all encounter difficulties, um, and the very idea of leaving a positive legacy can in our darker moments seem absurdly out of reach. In moments of doubt, even worthy projects can easily strike us as meaningless or futile. Our mistakes or misfortunes might seem to overshadow the possibility of any good coming of what we do. When we don't know what, if anything, matters, and when we don't know how or whether it's possible 
to contribute anything of value, crisis looms. On the model of care and selfhood that I sketched out a moment ago, not knowing what to care about or how to care for it is a way of not knowing who one is, and moreover, not knowing what one is doing. As McAdam says, generativity is hard work, um, and generative results need a good story. So that um, brings us to the second theme, narrative identity or narrative agency. So what is the nature of this need for a good story and what uh, makes redemption stories so well suited to move it? Um, according to McAdams, achieving a narrative identity is the main psychological challenge of emerging adulthood in modern societies. Um, a narrative identity, and here I quote from McAdams' book, The Redemptive Self, um, is the internalized and changing story of your life that you begin to work on in the emerging adult years, which ties together many different aspirations you have and roles you play into a meaningful narrative framework. <clears throat> I'm sympathetic to the idea and have myself um, tried to argue that self-narratives can solve problems of meaning for temporally extended agents like us. Um, the meaning or significance uh, of some events that take place at earlier points in a life will be shaped or determined by what happens later. In midstream, of course, we don't generally know with any certainty how things will turn out. We must often make decisions and act without certainty about the overall shape of the story in which the current decision or action will figure, and this means deciding and acting in the absence of certainty about the meaning or significance of what we do. Yet we must have some conception of what we're up to in order to deliberate coherently and account for ourselves to others. As self-narrators, we project an overall shape to the story um, in which a particular episode will figure. And the narrative structure we adopt allows us at least provisionally to fix a meaning for our choices and actions in real time. <coughs> Not all self-narratives are narratives of redemption, of course. Um, but once you see the patterns that McAdams puts before us, it makes perfect sense that highly generative adults should go in for this particular kind of story. Um, remaining resolute in one's generative efforts, maintaining the conviction um, that what one does now will matter in the end, especially given that the end is a moving target, um, seems to re require an astonishing form of moral courage. Um, the property of being redeemed um, is an example of what the philosopher Karen Jones, who also came up in the last discussion, um, calls a trajectory-dependent property. Um, a property is trajectory-dependent in Jones's sense if ascriptions of that property have temporally extended truth-makers. That is to say, um, whether it's correct to ascribe a trajectory-dependent property at a particular time depends on what happens else when, that is, at some earlier or later point. Um, this is, I think, how ascriptions of redemptive value tend to work. Uh, whether a tragic event, a hardship, or destructive deed has redemptive val value, that proverbi proverbial silver lining, um, is often indeterminate at the time of the event or the deed itself. Its redemptive value depends on how it figures into the story that's still unfolding. To avoid stagnation, um, the highly generative adult must remain invested in her generative projects or concerns, um, even though her confidence in the worthiness and fruitfulness of those projects and concerns can't fully be warranted by the sorts of evidence available to her midstream. I suppose the generative adult has to believe in them in something like the sense that Susan Wolf invoked yesterday um, in reference to NPR's This I Believe series. Um, the redemptive story projects a positive ending in which good follows from bad, thus reinforcing the narrator's sense of purpose and steadfastness in the face of such underlying uncertainty. The story acknowledges suffering and setbacks, but casts the narrator as specially positioned to do something constructive about them and as likely to succeed. Um, in short, the narrative spin that McAdams' subjects put on their and others' struggles assign those struggles meaning or significance within an overall trajectory of ascent, liberation, social progress, or triumph over adversity, a trajectory in which the narrator's own generative activity is called for, matters, and makes a difference. Note that the redemptive story doesn't just characterize the narrator's life thus far, although I recognize in these interviews people are looking back, 
Um, but it also gives her the Jenner to the dolls a kind of script or blueprint to follow going forward. Um, because of this forward-looking element, whether one sees and treats an event or action as figuring into a narrative of redemption may actually make it more likely that redeeming results will emerge. Um, in other words, conceptualizing one's experience on the redemptive model can make it more likely that the relevant truth-making trajectory will actually unfold. So um, parents who lose a child to accident or illness are often concerned that the death not be in vain and may thereafter devote themselves to raising awareness or funds um, for preventative measures or research that might help others. So in this way, they turn an otherwise senseless loss into a generative project. Um, and we clearly have scripts available for this maneuver in our culture. Um, in such cases, good may follow from bad in part as a result of the efforts of the highly generative adults who think of themselves and their life projects in that redemptive way. This means that redemption, to borrow another of Karen Jones's terms, is not just trajectory dependent, um, but also interpretation sensitive. Um, by interpreting events in a redemptive light, we may be prompted to act in ways that help to bring about the redeeming results that we narratively project. Um, so for this and other reasons, I can see why McAdams finds the redemptive narrative to be a good story um, for adults in their middle years to tell. Um, but I also appreciate his reservation. Uh, I do think it's overly simplistic to think that everything can be redeemed, um, and I don't think it's always appropriate to look for a silver lining. Sometimes people just need to grieve or reckon with a loss that they know cannot be made good. Some losses defy our ability to make sense of them, and we have to be able to live with that, too. And even when good things do follow from a serious loss, whether those good things are such as to redeem the loss um, is a complicated question, um, and a question of judgment over which reasonable people could disagree and feel quite differently. Though I've referred to the redemptive outlook as involving a form of moral courage, it also takes courage to look loss in the face, call it what it is, and carry on. I also resonate to the worry that the moral steadfastness of the redemptive self can sometimes border on self-righteousness or even rigidity. Um, when it does, I would argue it can interfere with virtuous caring. Caring well, caring about the right sorts of things um, in the right way and to the right degree, arguably requires sensitivity to considerations that challenge one's core convictions, um, since insensitivity to such considerations might leave one um, at high risk of caring in the wrong way um, about the wrong sorts of things. I'm also inclined to think that this kind of defect in caring um, may be a defect of economy, which might sound strange. I mean, at first blush, the redemptive self with its strong core values might seem a paragon of self-government. Um, but if the redemptive narrative itself disposes us to unreflectiveness about our guiding commitments, it might at least sometimes bec become the kind of narrative that gets us in its grips and deafens us to the sort of critical dialogue that I take to be essential to economy. Um, what kind of narrative could avoid these weaknesses? McAdams notes that the redemptive narrative, or at least certain forms of it, um, are culturally specific, not universally shared by generative adults. Um, it's perhaps a mark of the power of redemptive themes in the American context that despite its weaknesses and despite not actually being American, at least by birth, um, I find it somewhat challenging to imagine alternative narrative styles that could suit the needs of highly generative adults so well. Um, on the Ericksonian model, um, our, develop, uh, our developmental lives culminate after midlife um, in a struggle between despair and ego integrity. Mustn't we, to avoid despair, ultimately find our way to the view that some good has come or will come of our trials and tribulations? As long as lives involve difficulty and hardship, it's tempting to think that some sort of redemptive narrative must be involved in the avoidance of despair. Um, in preparing these remarks, however, I was reminded of a brief story that appeared in the New York Times um, last March about psychological research on family nor narratives, which was called um, The Stories That Bind Us. Um, one upshot of that story and the research it reported was that those families with strong family narratives seem to hold together more effectively 
than others when they encounter challenges. But the second upshot on which I want to focus was that the healthiest narrative was not a narrative of ascent, um, nor perhaps more intuitively of descent, um, but an oscillating narrative that emphasizes how the family has stuck together through ups and downs. It emphasizes that the family endures, it bounces back, it does not fray or come apart at the seams, it survives as a family. At the level of the individual, I would be tempted to describe someone with an oscillating narrative as having a resilient self rather than a redemptive self. Such a person needn't see all losses or setbacks as redeemed by something positive, but does see herself and those she cares about as emerging from them intact and going on, potentially, to future su successes. She won't project a steady path of improvement. She knows that things might get worse again, but she won't see the possibility of future disaster as decisively contaminating her story either. She might not be as prone to self-righteousness since resilience might require rethinking one's core commitments. And she needn't underplay the severity of tragedy or think that everything can be redeemed. Um, on the downside, survival, mere survival through life's ups and downs might seem anticlimactic um, as far as purpose or meaning goes. How inspiring is it to think that while one won't necessarily make things better, one will manage to carry on and not fall apart as a person. Could a narrative of resilience be enough to sustain our generative efforts? I'm not sure. Um, Alan Fisk noted yesterday that many people are quite fully preoccupied with the business of mere survival. And perhaps I shouldn't say mere survival, since it may be um, a relatively elite prejudice to think that lives less occupied are necessarily less meaningful. Um, perhaps an oscillating narrative of resilience can serve quite well. Um, modestly underpinning all the generativity and sense of purpose one needs. Um, as my eight-year-old son says when he's uh, describing Minecraft, a video game he's currently obsessed with to the uninitiated, and he says this with no sense of irony, it's great, it has no purpose. Um, there isn't a point to it. You just build stuff and try not to die. It's the best game ever. So I'll close on that note. <laughs>